Hannah. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Um, if anyone's listening, again, this is another one. We've, um, we've been asking, for, I've been one of those people asking for rain for weeks. Like, oh, please rain, please rain. I know it has, and it's really, really loud outside. So, um, yeah, we're going to do this for the backdrop of some uh, relaxing raindrop noises. We've got Hannah Starban from Natural Power. Um, Hannah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Um, and today we're going to talk about all sorts of stuff. Um, wind and solar parks, or hybrid parks, parks is the new word, um, and what you do at Natural Power, and generally what's going on in co-located batteries. So, um, Hannah, do you want to just introduce yourself? What do you do? Where do you come from? And, um, yeah, how do we know each other? Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, the rain is great. I'm also happy that it's raining, even though I got absolutely soaked on the way here. So yeah, if you can hear squelching, that is <laughs> That is shoes. my trainers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, um, we know each other from pretty much a few years of just being in the battery industry, going to the same events, talking to each other about revenue stacking and you know what's new for the UK market. Um, I have been in the renewable industry for about 10 years. Uh, I started out working for a developer and then I've been working at Natural Power for the last five years. So Natural Power is a technical and engineering consultancy. We work exclusively on renewable energy and, and sort of clean storage projects. Um, we are originally from Scotland, although I'm based in London. And we're about 450 people worldwide, so focused on the kind of UK, European and US markets. And Natural Power is, it only works on natural power stuff, right? So it's only renewables and clean stuff. The name is right? a giveaway, yeah. So no, <laughs> we wouldn't work right? on gas peakers, for example. That's, that's not natural enough for is us. Is there another consultancy that can say that? Is there another one that's, that's so... I'm just, sure there are. But Everose, do they only do yeah, stuff? Yeah, K two, I think maybe yeah. do offshore wind or wind energy. Yeah. Um, so there are others. But it's but pretty I think, strong. It's pretty strong. Yeah, and you know, I think we've definitely seen a consolidation in consultancies in the market where you know others have been sort of absorbed by bigger companies who also work on wider infrastructure and energy projects. So we're very proud of still being independent and also purely having that renewable net zero transition focus. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, props. And you guys have been doing it since the 90s, right? So Natural Power has been going on a pretty long time, based in Scotland. And you do um, you do some operational stuff as well, don't you? And some asset management stuff. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So we have a surprisingly high-tech control centre in the middle of nowhere in Scotland, in Dumfries and Galloway, where we look after a uh, probably about a quarter of the UK's onshore wind fleet, plus some batteries at the moment. So a lot of that is around sort of managing the data flows, um, managing projects that are operating the balancing mechanism, doing kind of access and, and egress management. So yeah, all the kind of day-to-day -day kind of data management and you know more and more also the sort of performance analysis and, and reporting on operational sites in and, the UK. And that's in the, I guess we should probably put a link in the show notes, but there's like a Teletubbies Hobbit style um, building <laughs> so in the middle of nowhere where I guess there's some people who sit there with a lot of screens controlling and monitoring stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So we call it the greenhouse. It's our, it's our global headquarters in the middle of nowhere in Dumfries Galloway um, with a green sort of roof, hence the name. Um, and like I said, it is it's really high tech in there. Um, lots of screens or 24 seven operations. We, I think one of the only private control centers in the UK that has a direct line to national grid. And it's literally a sort of red phone type situation where they can call us if they need us to curtail wind farms because we manage just that much capacity through this control center. Yeah, and what, what does that mean? So a quarter of all the onshore wind in the UK, what, what, what does that mean in numbers? How many wind turbines is that? Or how many megawatts, Ooh, gigawatts is that? Uh, Putting you on the spot here. You're asking me there, yeah. I, I actually, because it changes so much every year, I'm not sure what the latest stat is on onshore wind capacity in the UK. But it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. lot. It's definitely more than batteries, um, although batteries are also obviously growing hugely. But yeah, there's a lot of wind around in the UK. Here comes that. You know, there's so much. There's so many wind people who are constantly digging at batteries for being so much smaller. We got I'm, I'm not going to put you in that in that group. But that, that was a, that was that was the first strike, kind of. All right. So um, yeah, what else does Natural Power do? You guys do control center stuff. You look at wind. You look after wind turbines. You look after batteries. But your bit of the business. You do um, some pretty high techy consultancy stuff. What, what, what's happening there? Yeah, so I head up our due diligence and advisory team. So what we do is all about helping investors and lenders actually you know, fund these projects and make them happen. And we sort of act as the independent technical expert that looks at the projects or the portfolios or the platforms, whatever's being transacted upon, and tell them where the risks are and how they can mitigate them. So it's all about figuring out, you know, are these viable projects? Are they in line with industry best practice? If there are issues, which inevitably every project, you know, 
90% of projects, but pretty much every project has issues. You know, how do you mitigate those? How can you get around them? How can you bake in contingencies or, you know, work out a way to resolve them to make sure you still have a viable project? And the company says 450 people, we're going to talk about what you work on in a second, but there's 450 people-ish in the company mm. and um, you're in the UK and you're elsewhere too, right? Yeah, so majority of our staff are based in the UK. We have um, a, another office in Dublin, so we've got maybe 20 people there and then offices in France um, and in the US of so East Coast, West Coast and Central. So uh, yeah kind of growing all over. We've also got a few people in the Nordics and Poland, so kind of trying to trying to grow internationally, but our core markets are definitely kind of Western Europe and the US. And and who's the customer for the, for the work that you guys do? Is it asset owners or is it more, you know, banks and lenders or is it developers? Who well, do you work for? Well, it's really across the range. I mean, Natural Power, you know, one of the things we like to say is that we support people across the whole life cycle of projects. So if we're looking at, you know, early stage development, our clients would be developers who need help um, figuring out if a project's feasible and what it might look like, help even signing up land and actually talking to landowners, um, help getting the planning consent, so doing all the kind of environmental studies, ecology, you know, we've got people who go out in boats and count marine mammals for offshore wind farms, which <laughs> yes. I personally am quite jealous of, I think yeah. in another life that would be the job that I'd want. So it's either so it's, it's either marine mammals or it's bats, right? That's the two things you've got to look for with wind farms. Uh, newts, or newts, newts. Newts also very popular. So what are they called? Great, great crested? Great crested newts. newts, you don't want them on your you side. Um, so yeah, the whole kind of planning and development support piece. Um, and then we have a big construction team who would help with the kind of construction management of projects. So being the client's representative on site, making sure contractors are doing what they're meant to do, keeping track of budget and time scales, and actually just, yeah, running around with a hard hat and, and high vis and making sure these, these projects get built. And what, are you able to, to give some examples of the kind of customers that uh, you guys, that yeah, you, you work with? Sure. Is it, uh, the, yeah. I mean, it's anything from, you know, Primarily work on some large scale front of the meter projects. So um, that can include utilities. You know, we've worked with Stackraft, with SSE, Scottish Power, ESB. Um, we work with some more private developers. Um, the likes of well, Community Wind Power is one that <laughs> has wind power in the name, but they've yeah. also started to do solar and storage now. Um, I feel SMS like I went Energy. Hard at the start a... about wind. So we've got, we've got real, <laughs> we did a podcast recording just before this one. And uh, yeah, I think, I think I've got a bit of a chip on my shoulder today about mm -hmm. wind. But it's okay, it's okay, I'll take it all back. <laughs> well, to name some more storage players, you know, we, we've worked with like SMS Energy um, on some of their battery projects. Uh, we work yeah, they've got two now, right? Two, two big ones. Two big ones, yeah. yeah. And more, I'm sure more coming down the pipeline. Um, so yeah, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the work we do is kind of, because it's transaction related, it's, it's somewhat confidential, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. Okay, let's, yeah. get, let's get into the nuts and bolts of it, right? So mm -hmm. um, I want to talk today about co-location, because you guys are doing loads of work on co-location. Mm -hmm. And it's a hot topic because um, I think probably that's, well, about five years really, co-location has been a word that we've, we've banded around a lot. And still we're not getting the kind of um, assets built out yet. So there's a lot of sites that have got planning for, you know, solar that's got planning for a battery or battery that's got planning for a solar. And still we're only seeing one side of it get built out at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I'll, um, I'm interested to know why you think that is and what's changing in the future. I probably have a, maybe a bit of a different perspective on that oh, awesome. because we have been working on a lot of these hybrid projects and absolutely it's not, you know, it's still a small fraction of the total pipeline, but there are definitely projects and there have been for years, projects that have been built out and are happily operating in that sort of hybrid basis. I think, I do have some stats here because I looked them up. At the moment, about 10% of the UK's battery, operational battery fleet is co-located and that's not lot I mean that's less than 200 megawatts that is a small number but if you look at the pipeline of development projects I think it goes up to something like 20 percent of batteries that are currently in the pipeline that will or be planned to be co-located with other forms of technology so and that's, so that's like gigawatt scale then if 20 percent of the current pipeline is a lot so I know of the so I know the, there's the SSE one which is next to wind and then there's the um, something farm, the, the, the old UNESCO <laughs> one. The ones six, that everyone knows Meg about. And the ten, right? Yeah, the, the ones but that people know about is um, the UNESCO one, which is called Clay Hill, Clay Hill I believe. Yeah. That was, I think, the first subsidy free solar farm With BYD, and the yeah. first co located solar and storage project. So that made a lot of waves. I think they had like politicians, you know, cutting the ribbon and all of that. It was a really, you know, cool landmark project. Vattenfall have done um, at least one in Wales where we actually helped them do the planning consent. That's a site called. 
Penny Kimoid, I believe. Penny C, we call it. Penny yeah, C, yeah. If you can't pronounce the, the current, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's quite a chunky battery. I mean, for the time at least, I think it's like a 20 megawatt battery there, yeah. co-located with a wind farm. And then, you know, there are others, solar and storage. You know, you've got Cleave here that's you know, going to be coming into construction now. That yeah. made a lot of news for being the first, um, what we call a DCO project. So a solar farm that's so big, it had to be consented under kind of a special national planning regime. And that has a sort of hundreds of megawatts of storage co-located. And so is the storage actually getting built on that? Sorry? Is this, so they're going to build, they are actually going to build the storage on that? As far as I know, I mean, we actually supported Quinbrook when they acquired that project, um, which was last year. And certainly, with the conversation we had with them at the time, the plan was to build out both awesome. together. We need to put that in our database then. Mm. Uh, yeah, and there's the um, there's the Unicos one that's next to High Wind, isn't there? There's like a one megawatt there's one a, up there. There's one called Batwind, which Bat is, Wind, I think, the Ersted one. Wind. Yeah, great that's, name. <laughs> um, we should do like a dingbats of this at Christmas or something like that. And then uh, I think that's about it at the moment. But how there's 200 megawatts out there. We need to find these. <laughs> no, I think you're right that, you know, the fact that we can, you know, rattle off a good number of them sort of on one hand means that it is, it is sort of a fairly new concept. Um, and you're also right that while we see now the majority of solar farms put into planning with provision for battery storage, often that's just a little square on your layout drawing saying, and we might want to put storage here at some point with no intention to immediately build it out but with sort of keeping that in reserve for future if they wanted to add it which in itself i think is is meaningful and interesting because it means that these developers do see the market going that way and they might feel and i think this is a theme in the sort of legacy renewable industry that have done you know, generation development wind and solar no storage it's like they might not feel like they are ready or, or have the knowledge to themselves develop about the battery but they do see that it adds value and if they might want to sell the site at some point or once they have kind of upskilled more in that area, they could add batteries in future without going through a complicated kind of consenting process. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's like um, setting a house with planning permission to put a bigger bathroom in, right? You don't necessarily need to do it. You just need to get a piece of paper. <laughs> and, says uh, you can. And then, yeah, who knows what happens. All right, I mean, so, sorry, just a last point. Um, you know, like I said, Dantra Powell mainly works go, front of the meter. <laughs> <laughs> don't cut me off, no. Um, there's the whole behind the meter segment as well, right? And that is one that, you know, the UK has never been I would say the strongest market for residential and behind the meter yeah. renewables and storage. It's not like Germany where this is like really taking off, but um, it is also growing here and particularly the sort of commercial industrial segment where you know, people are having to deal with really high energy costs and it's only going to get worse. I mean, there's a huge incentive there to put behind the meter generation and storage. So I was hearing that apparently if you want to do, um, I want to ask you about German behind the meter now because you're German and you're an expert. So I'm going to bring those, th there's, a, there's a Venn diagram here that's coming. Watch this, right? But there's, um, someone told me that apparently now if you want to put domestic solar and a battery on your house, you essentially have to pay someone over the phone before they even speak to you because there's such a demand to get these surveys done. Mm. You have to pay a couple of hundred quid up front just to get someone to come out to, your house, come out to your house and even talk to you because there's so many people who want to go off grid or want to be self-sufficient, if you like. It's quite exciting, really. It's really, you know, I think we talk about our industry being a roller coaster, but that's exactly the same on the residential behind the meter <laughs> side because, you know, you don't have the same subsidies and peel-in tariffs in the UK that you had a few years ago. So kind of all the infrastructure and the installers were there and then really struggled when that support was cut because nobody was... You know, looking to do any more and I think now with energy prices going where they're going and some other things around like VAT um, being applied or not applied yeah that, I mean that, that demand is absolutely growing again so I'm not surprised to hear that you know you, you have to pay basically pay to get to play, someone yeah. to, to look at your roof and tell you what you can fit there and what's the deal with what's going on with behind I saw a graph from I think it was Bloomberg New, New Energy Finance and it was uh, it was a standard hockey stick graph of mm. like uh, battery storage stuff but then it had a carve out for Germany and then it had a carve out for behind the meter. Mm -hmm. And behind the meter is just so, so much bigger in Germany than front of the meter and so much bigger in Germany than anywhere else in Europe. What's the, what, do you know what's caused that? I think it's a combination and probably a sort of self-perpetuating circle of cultural attitudes towards energy. Um, and there's definitely a really strong you know, green movement in Germany and, and very much in the personal sphere of people wanting to become more autonomous and reduce their own carbon footprint and being very open to, to doing solar and storage in their homes. The other thing is the, the housing stock there is much newer than it is here. So yeah. houses and, and properties are way more, you know, it's, it's easier and more efficient 
to do that kind of behind the meter generation and storage because you're you know you're well insulated you tend to have a bit more space on a roof just things like that um make it easier my parents actually have put in solar and storage and actually also some solar thermal over oh, the last year nice. so i've I've been what a terrible position of being used as a private consultant for my parent <laughs> in a segment that is not really what i do professionally so. very dangerous move. absolute recipe for disaster I what have they gone for they gone for a sonnen they gone for a tesla yeah they actually they, they went for a sonnen system oh, i mean they look and really sonnen nice. the company is actually from a village that is about half an hour from where i grew up in the middle of nowhere in the bavarian alps so that that's a kind oh. of homegrown you, you know I don't know if it's Part marketing or product positioning. Or I don't mm. know, something about the Sonnen, as a battery mm. person, Sonnen, the Sonnen battery gets my heart racing. It's just, <laughs> they, they look so, so cool. All right, um, right then, next question. Mm. What on earth is an energy park and why is everyone talking about them? Yeah, um, energy park is one of these terms that sometimes gets thrown around and I have a feeling that some governments and some local planning authority have really latched onto that. Um, I would think Wales is a good example. There's loads of um, goodwill and support and incentive in, in Wales from the kind of planning authority to say, you know, propose us an energy park. We don't just want a wind farm, we want an energy park. And, you know, there are good reasons for that. I mean, if you just think about it practically, um, if you manage to stick a lot of infrastructure in the same site, you're kind of containing the visual impact, the noise impact, the environmental impact into one area. So in a situation where, you know, particularly with wind, there can be a lot of opposition and concern on you know, visual impact and noise are typically the things that developers have to contend with and have to very carefully manage, you know, as they should have to do with, with the local community. Um, I think there's a school of thought that says, well, if you're going to build a wind farm here anyway and have to go through all of that, why not add solar? Why not add storage? Put it all in one place. It's all then going to look more industrial, but at least it's going to be in one spot. <laughs> so I think that's maybe the sort of planning argument. And the other obvious argument is grid. And, you know, you talk to any developer, pretty much anywhere in Europe these days, they're all going to have a moan about grid. Um, and grid is the thing that makes development really difficult. That's really expensive. As in connections. Yeah, as in connecting, you know, finding a connection that you can actually export your power as a generator or as a battery, have access to both import and export. And that's because, you know, our grids were not built to have all this distributed um, intermittent renewable generation. So um, in some, you know, particularly in the remoter parts of the country, where the demand isn't so high, the grid is not you know, set out to really take in huge amounts of power and capacity. So having access to grid is really, really valuable. And if you have one of those grid connections, I think developers increasingly are like, well, how do I make the most of it? And again, that's where the energy park concept comes in, rather than just putting a solar farm onto this grid connection, where realistically, you're going to use that grid connection only during the day, and you're no, only gonna no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <What? laughs> mind blown but also you know even during the day you're only going to use kind of the maximum limit of the grid connection during the peak sort of during the boring bit yeah during yeah during lunchtime if it's sunny yeah um and the rest of the day you're actually sitting on a lot of spare grid so not surprising that developers are thinking about well how do i use that spare capacity and you know, you can combine wind and solar, you can combine solar and storage. People are now talking about combining you know, hydrogen and, and lots of other stuff as well. But yeah, it comes down to how do you make the most of your grid connection and also spread the cost that frankly is a big part of your, your construction cost. It's actually paying for that grid connection, spread it across multiple projects. And so um, the word park just means um, co-location and big. Uh, is big part of it or is it just is it just a trendy way to describe co-location? <laughs> I, I think it, probably the park might come more from the fact that people, you know, also sometimes refer to like a wind farm as a wind park. Wind park, um, yeah, power park. It has a bit of sort of leisure connotation, it does, doesn't it? And I mean, yeah. you do have sites like um, Scottish Powers, one in Whiteley is a really good example, mm. where it genuinely is a public recreation and leisure facility. There's cycling paths, so you can like walk around between the turbines. And they're looking to add solar there. They're you know, developing or building out now a battery there. They're talking about hydrogen. So it also maybe has that element of, you know, it, it's a park in the way that, you know, a public park can be a good thing for people to go and enjoy. Uh, Not everyone's an energy nerd like how, us, but... Yeah, I was going to say, do you know how out of touch we are, right? Because I can't... Uh, the, the, the idea of that sounds great. I really want to go. Mm. And then we've got, like... In the news, got Liz Truss and whatever, and like the winner, yeah. whoever wins the conservative, the conservative election, leadership election, it sounds to be the one who says the craziest thing about everything, mm. including solar. Now, uh, yeah, maybe maybe everybody doesn't want these parks to, to go and have the picnic in with a load of wind turbines. I do anyway. <laughs> I'd vote for that. 
So um, big co-located things with the word park on it. Um, and so you can either do wind and battery, you can do solar and battery, you can do wind, solar and battery and get a full house. Or now you can also do hydrogen. Yeah. So what's the, what's the hydrogen gig all about on an on a, on a energy park? Ooh, okay, big question. Um, and I feel like whenever you start talking about hydrogen, you might end up having an argument because people have very different views on what I the know hydrogen nothing. ultimately I know nothing. will be used for. So I'm going to park the what is it going to be useful for a bit and probably talk more about why you combine it with a traditional kind of renewable yeah. or something plus storage park. So hydrogen is great because it doesn't need a grid connection, right? Because hydrogen is not electricity that you would want to put into the electricity grid. It is gas and it's a good way of, sort of storing energy in gas form and then sort of do whatever you want with it. So that's kind of what's driving the hydrogen space is the fact that batteries are great at short term storage, but they're not going to be good at storing electricity for days, weeks, months, whereas we know we will need that. We know we have a really um, uneven sort of pattern of seasonal demand and seasonal generation. So we need something ultimately to sort that out. And that's so here's the deal. So the is it like hydrogen. a battery that's bigger than pumped hydro? Is that the kind of sphere that we're in? We're like, you've got pumped hydro, mm -hmm. flow battery, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. you've got lithium ion, then you've got flow batteries if, if that materializes, which hopefully it does. And then you've got bigger than that, which is like pumped hydro, Denorwiggy kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then is the hydrogen storage thing the bit beyond that? Longer duration. And when you say big, are you talking about storage, like duration of storage, or are you? You just call me out here. I'm just talking nonsense. <laughs> I? Um, I'm going to go with duration. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go with yeah. duration. Um. Yeah, I mean, in principle, you can sort of store hydrogen indefinitely. You know, you won't. It won't kind of be lost or be less efficient. It can literally just sit there in tanks. Now, you know, you don't want to build. So you want to size your kind of storage capacity appropriately for when you're going to use it. But yeah. Um, in, in the sense of duration, it is kind of unlimited. And in terms of scale capacity, it is very scalable. You know, you can you can have a one megawatt kind of electrolyzer plant, or you could build, you know, hundreds gigawatt scale type projects. It's very, it's like batteries in the sense that it's sort of scalable and stackable. And so the, 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 the park, the energy mm. park idea with hydrogen on it is, this is a fully green solution, right? This is mm. green renewable power coming in through an electrolyzer, turning uh, that electricity into, well, no, that's not true. Um, doing a, <laughs> the electricity powering a chemical reaction mm -hmm. that, that then creates hydrogen. Um, and what uh, outputs hydrogen. And so is the idea of putting, do, do these hydrogen facilities take up a lot of space and that's why we want to put them all together? Or is it just, um, is it an efficiency thing? Or, you know, what, uh, how, how does, how does the business case work? Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two kind of arguments for putting that electrolyzer, the hydrogen infrastructure next to your renewable generation. One is you then don't have to transport the electricity, you know, over kilometers where you would lose power and it'd be less efficient. You can just do it all on site. And the other is that, you know, we talked about access to grid being scarce. <laughs> and so there might be projects that, you know, can, can export some of their power into the grid, but sometimes they'll be curtailed because the grid is too constrained or they don't they actually have more generation capacity than they're allowed to export. So during a particular windy period or particularly sunny period, they kind of have to, they would have to kind of reduce their output and basically just lose energy that they otherwise could make money with. So the idea with hydrogen is rather than just turn your wind turbine down or turn your solar farm down, you use that excess electricity to make the hydrogen and then it gives you another revenue stream. So ultimately that, that would be the business case is sites that can't get access to the grid or that are curtailed use that electricity that otherwise would be wasted to produce hydrogen um, and then sell that hydrogen into various markets. This is the controversial topic that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> um, and then Don't make some extra money. get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, no, I'm not gonna say anything too controversial here. So uh, can I still get a CFD on my offshore wind farm if I put a hydrogen electrolyzer next to it? Um, yeah. What's the deal there? Yeah, so um, the CFD, which is contracts for different, so the sort of main support regime for offshore wind, but also for onshore wind and solar, it still exists, or it exists again, um, <laughs> <laughs> is yeah. a support scheme that now allows for hybrid projects. Um, so some form of renewable generation plus storage or even combinations of wind and solar, you could technically, I think, apply for a CFD. Now, in this last round that happened earlier this year, I don't believe there were any hybrid project that participated as such. I mean, Cleve Hill, which is a solar storage hybrid, 
did participate, but it's sort of put in a chunk of their solar capacity um, sort of on a standalone basis. And basically, as long as you can keep track of the energy flows within your project, like what's coming out of your solar farm and going into the battery and then going into the grid versus what might the battery take out of the grid and then put back in, as long as you can split that out, it's fine. You know, and the regulator has, as I've said, that's fine, has published guidance on how to, to do that, because what they understandably want to avoid is paying subsidy on electricity that actually isn't renewable and the battery is just sucked up from the grid and, and yeah, put back in. Yeah, you can sort of double dip, can't you? Yeah, can, yeah. yeah. But um, the UK is, you know, one of the markets where regulation does now allow that. And it's, it's actually quite advanced um, in other markets like Ireland. It's a lot more challenging still. So hybrid projects in Ireland, you know, the ones that we worked on that were kind of one of the first solar storage hybrids, they're literally just they're next to each other, but they have separate grid connections. Everything is separated. They just share like the site. Um, so, so there's really not much benefit. They both have to pay benefit. all the use of system charges yeah, and yeah, yeah. ouch. Their own grid infrastructure. So there's really very little commercial benefit. You probably you know, can operate them, maintain them together. You might get a bit of a cost saving there. But yeah, it really shows you how much of a role regulation has to play in supporting and enabling these kind of hybrids. And annoyingly, regulation always kind of lags behind the technology really and, and the innovation and the development side a little bit. And where are these big um, power parks going to be? Energy where parks going to be? Yeah, are, we, are, um, are they going to be in the middle of nowhere? Are they going to be on a coast next to wind? Are they going to be, yeah, um, Teesside? Everything's in Teesside these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, just throw a load of place up in the air, and Teesside will land face up for any sort of investment or it's industry. Also like, right although, now. yeah, coastal communities are you know really seeing some benefit from this, which is great. So absolutely, I mean, looking at the UK and looking at the amount of offshore wind that will be built out, I and mean, the government is very much betting on offshore wind to be the backbone of the UK's electricity system. There will absolutely be lots of times over the next few years where there's too much wind <laughs> and we need to do something with it. So it's logical that a lot of the sort of storage, particularly green hydrogen infrastructure, will be located at the point where those offshore wind farms are coming online. So my personal opinion is that probably we'll have the sort of onshore, the, the hydrogen generation stuff will be located onshore rather than offshore with the turbines, although there are also some really cool concepts about having you know, offshore hydrogen production with electrolyzers located in the turbines or sort of on a platform offshore. Um, we not, will see. You know, I'm I might be wrong the, about this, but I'm like, that seems more complicated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where to even... Yeah. I'm going to shake my head, but mm. not say anything out, out, loud, out loud about it. I just don't understand how... I don't... Just servicing anything offshore is so expensive and complicated. Mm. I don't know why you'd put anything else offshore. Just, just put it just put it on land. That being said, I mean, again, coming back to the kind of planning side and impact on communities, there's already a lot of you know, challenges and pushback with all these grid connections coming onshore. You know, that, that still has an impact. Yeah. And so to think like putting even more industrial infrastructure there could be challenging. But again, you know, we have the ports, we have, you know, loads of refineries and, and you know industrial facilities that already use hydrogen but they use the kind of fossil fuel type of hydrogen which is often called you know gray hydrogen or black hydrogen so for them it's quite easy to switch over to using green hydrogen that's been made from wind power so it makes sense that a lot of the the industry would be concentrated on there but then down the line i mean like i said earlier it's it's the remote areas that have difficulties with access to grid so you know we might well see you know, wind plus hydrogen somewhere in Wales or somewhere in Scotland where you might not have the hydrogen offtake directly there, but then you'll have to figure out a way to, to transport it. Then you've got to move it. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I don't know, I just feel like there's a lot of problems that are being solved with hydrogen, not, not your particular references there, but I think there's a lot of problems that are supposedly being solved with hydrogen that I think we should just skip that and go straight to electrification, personally. Um, but there's a big yeah. there's a supply chain issue that was, uh, issues with electrification in supply chain, in mm. planning, in infrastructure. I get it. I just feel like come the year 2100, someone somewhere is going to be saying, all right, okay, maybe we should have just electrified rather than skip the hydrogen bit. Yeah, and I completely agree Some with you. Places. Like, I'm very much in the school of like electrify what we can. That's going to be the cheapest and fastest yeah. and best way of doing it. And speed does matter here. You know, we're all like under a net zero by 2050 kind of goal. But, you know, there are absolutely sectors that you can't electrify. And, you know, the example I mentioned with existing refineries that use hydrogen for you know, ammonia, like fertilizer production, it's a huge industry. Yeah. It's actually loads of existing hydrogen demand. And that's all coming from you know, natural gas. So if we can clean that up, that's a good start, right? 100%. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, electricity isn't going to do anything there. So, yeah. It's, yeah, it's about finding the right uses for it. Um, and, you know, that there are some that are kind of in the middle, whereas it's the whole heat pump versus hydrogen boiler debate. Um, 
yeah, and I, I, I personally fall more on the, the electrification side of that yeah. particular one. <laughs> it's so funny, like, um, speaking to some of our uh, Scandinavian customers, and they can't mm. believe that there's even discussion. Well, firstly, they can't believe that, um, yeah, that we use gas for domestic heat, full stop. <laughs> and secondly, there's even discussion about using hydrogen rather than putting heat pumps in. But um, I want a heat pump. I don't have one. I really want a heat pump in my house. Um, but one day, maybe Santa will bring one for me. <laughs> OK. Um, can we talk for a second about, because you are a proper wind expert, and we don't have that many wind people on the on the podcast. Um, can you just talk briefly about what's going on in, in wind, particularly onshore? Because mm-hmm. offshore gets a lot of coverage, right? You've got the big CFD rounds. Oh, actually, onshore wind's now CFD too. But um, the, the mega projects are off, offshore. But what's going on onshore in, in the wind world? Um, probably people are happier than they have been in the last few years onshore. You know, onshore was very much in the UK, um, I think, the sort of ugly stepchild whatever you want to call it you know, where politically there was a lot of opposition you know support was withdrawn and you know it's very challenging for for onshore wind developers um and that probably benefited solar and storage frankly because a lot of people kind of pivoted into developing that but yeah onshore wind is sort of seeing a little bit of a renaissance in the uk because there is that cfd support again and also the the price point frankly of onshore wind has reached a point now where you can definitely also do these projects on a subsidy free basis through corporate ppas through utility ppas and that's very kind of standard now and you know outside of the uk you're seeing projects that are you know just as big as offshore wind farms like gigawatt scale onshore projects being developed in the nordics um that are you know providing a really substantial amount of their energy demand um and in the uk it's a bit more challenging you know i think partly because um, of grid, <laughs> yeah. and also because of the sort of planning regulations and particularly around tip height restrictions. So with wind turbines, you want to get high up to access the higher wind speeds. The higher you are above the ground, the windier it is. As you know, if you go on the roof of a building, you'll notice. So you want to build these things high. <laughs> we can see we've got sideways <laughs> rain hitting this window right now. So there's proof, or audible proof. <laughs> it's a lot of wind out there. Yeah. So you want to build them tall, but obviously the taller they are, the, the you can see them from further around and then from a planning perspective it gets more challenging it was actually getting to a point where the onshore wind sector the like turbine manufacturers have moved on and they're building bigger turbines now because most markets in the world are allowing these big turbines to be installed it actually became a bit difficult in the uk to still source turbines that are kind of stubby enough to fit within our no permitted tip height envelope. Yeah, because it's kind of legacy models in some cases that, that people have to use. So what are those numbers here? So what's a normal mm. tip height? So that's like the the maximum mm. height, is it? Of the... Yeah, so you're looking at like the, the top of the tower and then like the, the blade above that, that would be your tip height. And so what's what's a normal number for onshore wind in the UK? And then how big do they go offshore? What the, what's the, the difference? Mm, I mean, we normally talk about turbines spot, in the size of like um, capacity of turbines. And that's very much you know, correlated to the size of the blades. And therefore, the bigger the blades is the taller the tower has to be. So you don't like, hit the bottom. <laughs> yeah. So offshore, you know, people are easily building like 12 megawatt turbines now. I would say that the big boom in UK onshore wind, people were putting out two, three megawatt turbines. So way, way smaller. And now the current generation of onshore turbines that's being built is probably around sort of six megawatts. And that's what's going up in the Nordics, where you can have these really tall tip heights. In the UK, I would say the the goal for developers is to get to like 220 meters. If you can get that, then that's pretty good. And then you can fit in a decent sized turbine, but it's not going to be possible on every site. And it is difficult, you know, because the planning process with wind takes so long. Um, compared to batteries or even compared to solar. What is it, what, um, I'm mm. really interested in that. So um, why does it take longer and what's, mm. what's the time difference? So battery, you'd be able to consent like easily within a year, right? Yeah. Um, with a wind farm, you have to you know, find your sign. You have to do lots of studies. A lot of the time you have to do sort of bird and, and mammal surveys that last over the relevant season. So at least a year of just survey time. Um, and then often they go through an appeals process. It kind of goes back and forth. So you might you know, end up with certainly yeah, two to four years, I would say. And it can't even be longer than that to, to get a wind farm consented. And because the technology is moving on, what, you're, what developers have to do is kind of put in a sort of guess of like what, what kind of turbines they're going to put on there based on where they think the market will be. And if it takes longer to consent the project, they might have a consented wind farm. But then they're like, oh, no. Um, it doesn't make sense to put those turbines in anymore. I want to put in a bigger turbine. I have to go back and like 
seek a variation to my consent and redo a lot of my studies because I'm now dealing with taller turbines. So oh, no. it can really be a long drawn out process. And like to be honest, Betamax offshore turbine. offshore's even longer. But yeah, onshore is not free from, from those problems and that it's can be pretty sad that the Nordics are installing gigawatts uh, size mm. onshore wind. Mm. And we've got some lovely onshore wind areas and we're just not doing it because I guess people don't want to look at them. I know, okay. I should emphasize that there's been lots of surveys done that actually public support for onshore wind is really strong. The majority of people want more onshore wind and like onshore wind and say they would be happy to live near an onshore wind farm. However, there is you know, quite a strong sort of organized anti-lobby. Um, and I also think, you know, as, you know, none of us are above this. When something gets proposed in your back garden, you probably do think yeah, about it a little bit differently. Yeah. So yeah, um, that, that element of, of sort of public opposition is one. But again, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. You know, we're working on a wind farm right now that is that's coming into construction. That's 200 megawatts. That's that's a big that's, project. Yeah. And you know, these wind farms have a, a capacity factor, which is like a measure of how much electricity they produce. You know, compared to their sort of theoretical maximum um, of like 40 percent onshore. And that's because the UK wind resource is really good. It's not as good in the Nordics, which is also why they have to go higher in the Nordics. It's not as windy there. Uh, take that Nordics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all um, rosy over there. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so 200, so a 200 megawatt wind farm, mm. onshore wind farm in the UK. Mm. So that will do f on average 40 percent of that. Right. So it will do yeah. on average 80 megawatts ish um, across 24 hours or across a year. Yeah, that's that how you think about it, yeah. Okay, cool. Because uh, we had um, Ross on talking about solar recently. Mm. Yeah, and, and capacity factors. Because there's there's like two numbers, right? There's, mm. Someone's got a gigawatt portfolio of renewables, but it only does X. Uh, mm. And so um, it's, it's important to understand the differences, or for me to understand anyway. Yeah, because the solar farm capacity factor is what, like 10, 12% of yeah, yeah, the UK? Yeah. So, so when you've got a gigawatt yeah. solar portfolio, it's like, <laughs> you do, but uh, yeah. No, no disrespect to the solar people out there. Mm. All right, so... Um, I want to talk about batteries because yeah. that's what we love uh, above all else, of course. Um, and you guys are doing quite a bit of work on, on energy storage across technical advisory and now asset management and monitoring and some other data stuff, aren't you? So um, what's going on in the projects that you're seeing and working on? I think what's been really cool in the UK in the last you know, year or so is just that the scale of individual projects has exploded. You know, and we're seeing lots of projects coming forward that are like 500 megawatts of storage in one spot or even bigger than that and then we're also seeing longer durations so maybe you know two hours so you know a gigawatt hour of, of storage in one spot and compared to i mean you know this was currently sort of on the system typically your maximum sort of 50 megawatts of, of storage that's a huge difference it's still big guys it's still big this is yeah, yeah. <laughs> not not denying that yeah, yeah. but again you know when we come in say as a planning consultant helping our clients you know get consent for these projects that does make a difference because it turns from you know a couple of shipping containers to actually this is now quite a big area with you know lots of containers or lots of enclosures or some sort of warehouse solution and you know whereas in the past it was very much like oh yeah storage will get consented no but you could possibly object to this once you talk about these bigger schemes you probably do have to do a bit more work as a developer to kind of demonstrate and analyze the impacts and make sure that you know it's all you know as it should be so the scale thing has been really cool i think <laughs> and also technically really interesting because you do see people proposing concepts like um you know warehoused systems that are sitting inside a building or double stacked um storage yeah. uh which you know as as engineers and technically we look that? at that and we're Hannah? like mm, yeah it's, it's maybe not maybe not the best um please do tell well you know fire safety is is really important. And I think, you know, it's only taken what one major incident of a fire in, on a UK battery project for planning authorities and the public to get, you know, way more concerned about this. And frankly, I think, you know, our industry in the UK wasn't taking it seriously enough and, and wasn't really knowledgeable enough about this stuff. Mm. And as people are developing these bigger schemes, they're kind of having to, you know, deal with this. They're having to grapple with their insurance people who are, you know, putting in pretty strict requirements and asking lots of uncomfortable questions. Um, so that, that's been, fun even though it's a really serious topic but it's been fun um well, it's just engaging a curve, with right? developers yeah yeah and i think you know the, the u.s market is definitely leading the way on this and that's where a lot of the the standards and the best practice guidelines on fire safety are coming from so we've in natural power really benefited from having a a u.s business that's been doing storage you know for just as long as we have and have seen all of this and and yeah probably have a bit more lessons learned and a bit more here's genuinely what 
what makes a difference and what matters that we can bring to the UK market. Yeah, I mean, even I remember when EDF EDF built the the EFR battery they got, the one that they got, uh, the oh, what's it called? It's next to the power station. Alex is going to kill me for forgetting this. And it's got massive blast walls between them. Mm. And remember when they built that and we saw photos um, back when I was at Centrica, I was like, ah, oh, this is, you know, these, these guys are doing it properly. Mm. Centrica also built a beautiful battery in a, in a building with completely over-engineered <laughs> fire and safety stuff yeah. um, because they wanted to be completely sure, you mm. know, it was going to be, uh, that they could manage that risk. And then everybody else was just putting containers in, in fields. Yeah, so. yeah, and shoving them right next to each other and sort of hoping for the best um, and really not thinking at all about the risk of, you know, fire propagation. Um, and also, you know, the risk of, of first responders having to, de- to deal with this. I mean, that that's the thing, I think. That said, I think separation, I think air separation, and this, um, you'll be closer to the technical mm. detail, but... I've got. I think the school of thought at the moment is blast walls aren't necessary, and air separa- suitable mm. air separation is enough for containerized systems. I think. Yeah, no, you yeah. don't. You don't need blast walls if you leave enough space, and if you think about your venting. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you want to vent upwards, ideally, not, yeah, not, not sideways. Yeah. And also access to the container. So you know, we we're moving away from a system where it's like a shipping container where someone has to open the door and walk inside to to get to anything, but being able to access the batteries from the outside is way safer. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so what else are you guys working on and what, what are you seeing as trends? So bigger systems, mm. we talked about half gigawatt, gigawatt hour batteries, mm. um, which just blows my mind. <laughs> I can't wait to, uh, I want to go to, I want to go and walk around one of those sites when they build it. Uh, it's um, going to look very boring. <laughs> yeah, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, it will, won't it? I'm mm. still going to get excited about it. And um, what, other, what other trends or, or things, things are you seeing out there in the battery space? Well, you know, I think you're, you guys are the experts, this, right? That it's sort of evolving revenue stack, and um, you know, a lot of the time we're talking to developers and, and investors and asset owners who've come from the renewables world, who are used to, well, I'm just selling my electricity and I get money for it, um, and they really struggle with the the complex and you know slightly unpredictable and ever changing revenue stack that is battery storage. So while you know every year we see a you know a few more kind of clients of ours make that leap and be like okay, we, we feel like we get it now, we can invest in this, we've convinced our, our board, we've convinced our shareholders to, to invest in storage, you know, it's always, you still have to have that conversation. Yeah, it's mad, it's, um, the, uh, the, I want to do the digging back now at the wind and solar industry, but mm-hmm. wind and solar has been so used to availability, mm-hmm. like the, the, the way you operate effectively is making things available. And available is just, it doesn't cut it in the battery world, mm-hmm. right? You can be available, mm-hmm. But it's the first real power systems asset class where you've the way that you operate is the difference between losing money and making money, mm. um, which I just think is, is, is so exciting. And it's, a, it's part of a, a bigger trend of um, all assets now are an optimization problem. You know, DNOs now are seeing their assets as an optimization problem, not a build more copper, but how do I use these things better? Everything is becoming an optimization problem in a world of limited resources. Um, you've really got me going on about this <laughs> stuff now. No, but you're right. I mean, that's exactly what's happening. And even the developers who are, you know, not looking at developing batteries, who are just doing solar and wind, they have to deal with this because, you know, they know that in the future merchant world, it's not enough to just be like, well, I'm going to dump my megawatt hours onto the grid whenever it's sunny or whenever it's windy. Like, you will have to manage that merchant risk because we will be in a world, and we're already starting to see these periods where. If it's very windy in the UK, our prices, our wholesale prices drop and even go negative. So if you're someone who's kind of exposed to that wholesale price and you're just dumping your power onto the grid, that's not a way to operate a wind farm. You will have to manage that risk and co-locating, you know, bringing it back to the hybrid point, co-locating with some form of storage is a really good way of managing that. Yeah, you're leaving, you're leaving a ton of money on the table. Mm. How about, um, so asset management, what's happening there? Because um, I know Natural Power won some contracts recently. I don't know whether you're allowed to talk about it, but um, you won some contracts to, to do asset management on behalf of asset owners to look after those batteries and make sure mm. that they are running uh, efficiently and effectively. And um, I guess until recently, that wasn't really a problem, right? You, you, in, in wind, you have to do a lot of operations and maintenance for mm. batteries. You didn't have to do much. And now suddenly, I say suddenly, gradually, not suddenly, the opposite of suddenly, the, the, the industry is, is, is realising that these things need to be looked after. Mm. Um, and similar big asset owners, you know, the big funds have done this from, for a long, long time. But a lot of the newer players, are, it, it, I, think it's, um, I, I, I think it's a surprise, or it can be a bit of a surprise. Um, did I say that diplomatically enough? I don't really think I did. <laughs> Please, I didn't mean to offend anyone. But essentially, asset management is important, Hannah. Why? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you do 
you sound a bit aggressive there. No. Um, I guess taking it back to, to maybe some of the differences between convention and renewable generation and storage, where you're right, like a wind farm, solar farm, you have to send people out there in a van to, you know, to maintain them, to fix stuff, to, to swap out parts. You do have to do that with batteries as well, mm-hmm. but it's, it's less of a day-to-day activity. The other thing is with wind and solar, you normally get a really lovely, fully wrapped operations and maintenance contract where some party will do absolutely everything for you. They will manage the warranty for you. They will do all the maintenance, the scheduled maintenance and like responding to faults. They will monitor the system around the clock. They will write your reports. You know, it's all kind of packaged. They will give you the performance and availability warranty. It's all in one piece. Whereas with batteries, I think there's maybe less standardization just yet. And we see more that your, you know, your OEMs are taking on some of that but then there might also be another party that does the more sort of low-tech maintenance and you know, there might be another party doing the hv side of it so you kind of have more contractors and more interfaces to manage which is where an asset manager should be able to add a lot of value so i think there's that the sort of day-to-day you know how does the the whole contract suite look like on the project and how is that managed and then it's like you said it's the the sort of data and performance side of it so what is the battery doing is your optimizer doing a good job and you know that's where companies like Modo help because they allow you to kind of see what what your asset is doing compared to other assets. That's a huge thing, actually, that we don't have in the wind and solar world necessarily, is being able to see publicly how your asset is performing compared to others, because there isn't that same like public um, Watch this space. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you've got plans. But yeah, I mean, that's always been a real bugbear, I guess, for the industry that people are very private with their data. Of course they are. So getting that benchmark is hard, whereas in storage um, it is not easy, but it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I was just, just waiting for that one. Um, all right, I think we've run out of time, mm. Hannah. What else? We, um, do you want to plug anything? Is there anything you're working on that everyone should know about? Um, this is the chance okay. to get your message out there. So, is there anything else you want to add? Also, um, no is an acceptable answer. Oh no! I mean, I do want to obviously plug stuff. <laughs> and we've talked about hybrids. I genuinely, I am, I am weirdly passionate about hybrid projects. I think it makes so much sense. Um, and I'm really excited by how much the industry is really starting to seriously grapple with that and, and really, yeah, just thinking about what, what's the best for their projects in a way that's what's best for their children, you know, <laughs> how can we find the right combinations of stuff? And I think that that's something we in Natural Power have a lot of experience in helping people figure out, you know, how much of the different technologies do you put together? How is it all going to work? Practically, but also from a revenue and optimization side. So yeah, if anyone who's listening is, is kind of getting their head around that at the moment, please do get in touch. Well, we'll put a link in <laughs> the show notes. And that's it. I want to say, Hannah, that, that was a great conversation. And um, thanks for pulling me up on all the all the things, all the nonsense that I talk about. Um, I want to say to anyone who's listening, please do hit subscribe. It really does mean the world to us. And uh, let us know what you think in the comments. Until next time, thanks very much. Thank you.